October 30th, 1942. Reveille is at 0600, and it's still dark outside. We get some hot coffee and food. No one knows for certain what's happening, although there are lots of rumors. One says that we still haven't reached our destination. Another says that this is only one regiment from the division. We'll go from here to our unit in Stalingrad. The unit's strength is reported to have been dramatically cut, and we are the replacements. We're told that the entire regiment doesn't even amount to two companies at the moment. Rumors are often the only source of information for the common soldier. Even if they don't exactly fit the facts, there is normally a certain amount of truth in them. I miss Obergefreiter Marzog and the others from the convalescent company at Insterberg. It seems they have already been picked up. Now, for us, the usual routine starts up. Fall in two ranks. We line up so that we're always in the second row, so that we can stick together. All except for Malzan. The entire group is 90 men strong. To the 1st Battalion, Regiment 21, orders a young Oberleutnant. Round about noon, we are picked up by some trucks and four Mercedes personnel carriers. The vehicles are all wearing the division's tactical emblem, a leaping rider in a circle. I'm given a seat next to the driver of an eight-man personnel carrier. We set off along an MSR, a wide road packed with traffic. The road is undulating, the surface smooth and shiny like bacon rind, stretching away across the step almost in a straight line. Now and then, roads branch off, the junctions plastered with unit designation symbols and the names of villages. Rumors are flying. It's no longer certain that we're going to Stalingrad. I ask the driver, who is a Obergefreiter. He says that we are not going to Stalingrad, but rather to a so-called winter position. This is where the baggage trains are situated, because they can no longer be brought into Stalingrad, from which the troops fighting in the northern suburbs of the city are supplied with food and ammunition. The 31st of October. The winter position is close to a Kolkaz in the open steppe. Along one side, there is a Rachel, a deep, often long, rectangular trench where the steppe suddenly dips down. These Rachels are natural geological phenomena and are often 10, 20 feet deep in the otherwise flat landscape. A Rachel can be small or large enough to give protection to an entire battalion complete with vehicles and men. A Hauptwachtmeister in soldier's slang, also referred to as Spies or Mother of the Company, meets us. He informs us that we now belong to a division rich in tradition, which even in the Polish and French campaigns was still a cavalry unit. He explains that the unit is therefore particularly proud of its old cavalry designations. A Feldwebel is called a Wachtmeister, and a company is called a Schwadron, whilst a battalion is called an Abteilung, and a Hauptmann is a Rittmeister. Yes, Herr Hauptwachtmeister, we yell at his question, whether we have understood him or not. After one more division, we are 30 men in the first schwadron, while the others are sectioned off to the other schwadron and located quite close to us, actually. We are then informed that our schwadron was fighting with a total strength of only 26 men. Our regiment was also under strength. It was fighting in the ruins of Stalingrad, mostly in small combat units, which because of the scarcity of officers were frequently led by Unteroffiziere. The engagements were said to be murderous. Brick walls were no longer standing, and the piles of dead and wounded got higher every day. This news certainly didn't breed enthusiasm. What had happened to all the successes and the reports of the proud German army's advances, the ones we'd heard only few days ago? Were they exaggerations, or was this merely a temporary setback to the usual run of successes? 1 the 6th of November Considering the situation, we are all surprised to discover that we are not off to the front immediately. Instead, we have to put up with the normal Army Mickey Mouse routine. Salute the officers, stand to attention, take up formation, listen to guff from our leaders, and so on. Even when their training is completed, recruits are only novices and have to prove that they are real soldiers. All well and good, but they should give us the opportunity to prove it. The 9th of November, the intermittent explosions and general racket from the Stalingrad front are barely audible here. At night, the sky is always red, and the paralytes of the Rollbahn UVD can often be seen out, searching for likely targets. This evening's stuff from the stores is being handed out. Each man gets a bottle of juniper brandy, some cigarettes or tobacco, a little chocolate and some writing materials. 
When I was 16, I barely survived a bout of alcohol poisoning while on holiday helping a friend bottle cognac for his parents' restaurant. I now throw up if I so much as smell alcohol, so being a heavy smoker, I'm swapping my brandy with some of the non-smokers for extra tobacco or cigarettes. The alcohol brings a bit of atmosphere into our bunker, and after a while, song is in the air again. Grommel and I stay sober because we have to take over the next watch. It's cold and windy, and I'm glad I've got my heavy-lined winter coat. During our march, I cursed it on more than one occasion because of its great weight. I wake Grommel for his shift, and all the rest are sleeping. There is a stench in the bunker that knocks you over, so I let in some fresh air. The 11th of November. The weather is colder, but at least it stays dry. Overnight, everything has been covered in white frost, like fine filigree. There is movement in the air every day. Our bombers are flying toward Stalingrad. You can pick out the Russian anti-aircraft defense zone from the puffs of smoke in the sky. I'm on watch with a friend from our bunker. The supply truck has just returned from Stalingrad, as it does every night. They unload two dead and three wounded. An Oberwachtmeister is said to be seriously wounded. They're loading the wounded into an ambulance, which will take them to the main medical station. Up to this point, we hadn't seen any dead men. The bodies are always buried in a special spot. I saw all the wooden crosses days ago as we drove by them while on maneuvers. Three Lanzer have come back with the supply truck and are to be reassigned for health reasons. They are told to go to different bunkers, and one of them comes to ours. I return to the bunker after my guard duty and discover that my place on the mattress has been taken. The Lanzer from Stalingrad has taken it. I can hardly make out his face. It is covered with beard stubble. His peaked cap almost covers his eyes, and the ear flaps are pulled way down over his ears. He's in a deep sleep, though he doesn't snore. Every now and then he gives a twitch, as if he is having a bad dream. I lie down in Kurat's place. He is the guard who relieved me. The 12th of November. Today, at noon, our sergeant major has taken me off maneuvers and given me a special job. I've got to dig a new latrine because the old one is already full up. The two Russian prisoners taken out of Stalingrad a couple of days ago are supposed to help me with this task. This is the first time I've seen Russian soldiers up close, and I look at them with curiosity. In their dirty brown coats and greasy headgear with long ear flaps, they do not look particularly trustworthy. They do not exactly ooze danger, but rather just give the impression of being more foreign. One seems to be of Mongolian descent. Their faces are unshaven and gray, with restless eyes. I can sense insecurity and apprehension in their faces. I would probably feel the same if I were in their shoes. Both Russians turn out to be quite lazy types. I reckon they are between 25 and 30 years old. I have to chivvy them quite often in order to get work out of them. We have just finished digging, and I'm just admiring our work when a Russian standing next to me throws his shovel down and lunges past me directly into the trench. The other leaps after him and I crouch down, thinking, before jumping into the trench as well, landing directly on top of the first Russian. All three of us are now flat on our stomachs in the trench and can hear the rattle of aircraft cannon as the shells hit the ground directly above us. Then a shadow, accompanied by a droning noise, which I know all too well, flies sideways over and past us. The Iron Gustav must have crept up on us while coming in low over the Kolkhoz. The new latrine is some way away from the rest of the unit. I peer over the edge of the trench towards the bunker and the vehicle dugouts. The Iron Gustav is turning back at low altitude, and he again opens fire with his two wing-mounted cannon. He also drops several medium-sized bombs. Then suddenly, there are two more combat aircraft in the sky. They also spew metal from their wing-mounted cannon and drop bombs. The other part of our unit must be over there, or are they firing on the men on maneuvers? Machine guns from all over the place now fire back at the aircraft, and I can also hear the louder bangs from a 20M anti-aircraft cannon. Sparks are flying from the bellies of the aircraft, just as if someone is doing some welding. Normal bullets bounce off the armor, but suddenly there's a smoke trail. A hit! One Iron Gustav peels off, smacks into the step, and bursts into flame. The rest flee. I jump up and head for the bunkers and the vehicles. Except for the men in the orderly room, only a few sick and a couple of drivers have stayed in the bunker. I can see one or two bomb craters close by the vehicles, some of which have a holes through their side paneling. Petrol is escaping from one of the trucks. 
The rest of the unit arrives back from maneuvers late in the afternoon. They've heard nothing about an air attack. They were much too far away. Warius says that they were near Karpovka, along the Kalach, Stalingrad railway line. The damage to the bunker is quickly repaired. The 13th of November. The weather has hardly changed. It's cold and dry. It's supposed to be 15 degrees centigrade or plus 2 degree Fahrenheit in Stalingrad. The Russians are launching attacks in our unit sector every day, preceded each time by a big artillery barrage. The attacks have so far been repulsed, but with heavy losses. There are now only 18 men left on the front line from our squadron. The entire regiment has been reorganized into a single combat unit and is moved around to where it is needed most. Hot meals and fresh ammunition arrive more or less on a daily basis. Besides the kitchen wallas and under a fitcher winter, the medical orderly goes along, plus two drivers with their vehicles. Two volunteers are needed to lug the mess buckets around. Cooper and I volunteered yesterday. The roster goes around from bunker to bunker, and it's now the turn of our one. The 21st Panzer Grenadier Regiment's War Zone in Stalingrad, October-November 1942. It's almost dark when we move off. We've got one Steer 70 MTW personnel carrier with a soft top and a one and a half ton Opal Blitz Force 4 with a tarpaulin cover. We drive off into the dusk with our lights dimmed. The kitchen walla knows the way, but he says that there can be no talk about a Hauptkampflini in Stalingrad as amidst all the ruins the front shifts hour by hour. Not long ago, our line lay north of the tractor factory, but as of yesterday, it is apparently further to the south in a sector known as the Tennis Racket. The Russians are supposed to have a chemical factory there, which they are defending, and so they have set up a bridgehead. We need to ask for directions, Unteroffizier Winner says to us. Well then, let's go. We can only hope that we find them soon. We are now driving purely by the light of the moon on an MSR. Traffic comes towards us and also overtakes. To the right is the railway line running from Kalach to Stalingrad. Just beyond Woroponovo Station, we turn off to the left, and after a few kilometers, we're already well inside the ruins of the city. We drive through shallow craters and over heaps of rubble, avoiding debris and overturned telegraph poles. Thick, acrid smoke from smoldering fires chokes our lungs. To the left and right are burnout wrecks of various bits of military equipment. Our driver zigzags slowly towards what looks like a small forest or park. We are now standing on top of a small hill and can see something of the city. More black smoke and smoldering fires, a terrible sight, and we can feel Stalingrad's hot breath. This must be how Rome looked after Nero put it to the torch. The only difference is that here the inferno is made worse by the screaming shells and lethal explosions, increasing the madness and giving the onlooker the impression that he's witnessing the end of the world. The further we penetrate into the city, the closer the shells fall around us. The usual evening blessing from Ivan, remarks the medic. It was supposed to sound lighthearted, but it falls flat. He is sitting cowering on ammunition boxes as I am. My heart is hammering in my throat. Fright has gripped me. Now there is a new noise in the air, like the rush of a thousand wings. It is increasing in intensity and seems to be coming directly at us. Get out! It's the Stalin Orgel! yells the medic. We jump out of the wagon and dive for safety underneath a large burnt-out tractor. The rushing noise passes us, and then the explosions rain down around us just like fireworks. A splinter the size of a man's hand spins by my head and hits the ground beside Cooper. That was a bit of luck, says the medic. Behind us we hear yells and cries for the medic. Someone from the anti-aircraft position must have been hit. That's the one we drove by, says Unteroffizier Winter who has just jumped into a hole. Come on, let's go. We've got to get on. We climb back onto the vehicles. The medic says that the Stalin Orgel is a primitive rocket launcher, mounted on the back of an open truck. The rockets are fired electrically. They can't hit a precise target. But by using this weapon, Ivan can saturate a large area of ground, and God help those who find themselves inside it without any shelter. We are now driving very carefully. Many places have had to be thoroughly cleared so that vehicles can get through the wreckage. We meet other vehicles, who seem to have the same idea as we do. Many of them are loading up with wounded and dead. They can only do this at nighttime, when in theory, 
The Russians can't see what's going on. But the enemy does know what's going on, and he is pulverizing the area with his artillery and other big guns. There are always some name machine in the air. We can often see these biplanes quite clearly, silhouetted against the fiery glow in the sky. Tracer rounds climb high into the sky, and in front of us we can hear the rattle of machine gun fire. I can tell it's Russian fire by the sound. Hand grenades are going off and we can hear yelling, so we come to a halt amidst the ruins. Winter disappears, returning some minutes later. Our people are supposed to be in the same area they were in yesterday, he says. We'll move in as close to them as we can, and then we'll have to carry the stuff the rest of the way. The vehicles move off again, gingerly, a yard at a time. I can see two burnout Russian T-34 tanks. We pass them and come up to a large building with big open spaces, like a factory. In the background, standing out against the glow of the fire and rising out of the ruins, is a tall chimney, looking for all the world like a threatening finger pointing up to the sky. We pull up in the shadow of the factory. We start to unload, but Russian artillery shells are falling precisely where we want to go. Some of them land pretty close to us as well. A fire flares behind us. A vehicle has been hit. There is another big blaze nearby, probably a petrol dump or something like that. We wait, all ready to go. There are craters in front of us, lumps of stone and piles of debris. And between the screams of artillery shells and the thunderous roar as they explode, I get goose pimples. We move in zigzags, clambering over stones and beams, stumble, lie flat on the ground, get up again, and continue on. Stay close together, croaks Winter. In the glare of a fire, I can see men running, then some hand grenades go off. Several figures run past us, bent double. Winter gets up and speaks to them. I can recognize an officer's uniform. We've got to move further over to the right, he says afterwards. A couple of hours ago, they threw Ivan out of this area. Now there's hell to pay because he wants to take it back. We creep carefully forward. Then we come to an open space littered with clods of earth and concrete blocks with iron rods sticking out. This was perhaps once a bunker, destroyed by our bombs. A long wall rises at the other end. Three pillars are still standing. They are supposed to be there somewhere, says Winter, pointing to the wall. We can't go any further. Ivan is firing like mad at the churned up ground which we have to cross. Has he spotted us yet? We crouch down behind the concrete blocks, but the shells are landing so close to us that I can sense the hot metal on my face and can feel the muscles on my back cramping up. In front of us, tracer bullets shoot up into the sky. Rifles and machine guns crackle. Is Ivan on the attack? The shooting gradually dies away. Go now! To the wall! It's winter, barking out his orders. We run through the confusion of rubble, wire, and lumps of iron. We can't see anybody. We slither along the wall and come to a basement entrance. Suddenly there's a shout from somewhere, as if from the grave. Hey mate, get out of here! What do you want to do? Bring Ivan down on our heads? A steel helmet sticks up from the ruins. We're looking for our unit, I hear Winter whisper. Which one? Winter tells him. No idea. We don't belong to that crowd. But if you're looking for the ones who chased Ivan out of here this morning, you'll find them about 50 meters further to the right in that large factory building. But get out of here, and thank your lucky stars it's quiet at the moment. The head with the steel helmet disappears again. He call this quiet? We hardly dare lift our heads out of the dirt. During a short lull we stumble on, pieces of broken glass crackling under our feet, shadows springing out of the ruins. Immediately tracer bullets zip towards us and bursts of machine gun fire hit the wreckage all around like a hailstorm. We hurry onwards, the mess buckets clattering against the blocks of concrete. A shadow appears beside us. Are you the supply blokes from the first squadron? Comes the question out of the darkness. Is that you, Domscheid? Winter demands in return. Yep. I've been waiting for you for two hours to show you the way. Are we relieved? Domscheid is an Obergefreiter. He tells us that they carried out a counterattack this morning and are now positioned a bit further forward in the factory building. Winter swears. Every time we come, you are somewhere else. 
One day we'll probably deliver these supplies straight to Ivan. Oh, that's been done before, says Domscheid. Last night, four men from the 74th Infantry Division walked right into Ivan's hands with food and ammunition. During the counterattack this morning, only empty containers were found. There was no sign of the men. We creep behind Domscheid, Tracer whizzing in from both sides. I stumble and bang a metal strut with my canteen, making an awful row. Immediately, a Russian machine gunner opens up and a strip of Tracer bullets lights up the night. Ivan is pretty close. We lie down flat. The shots sing over my head and explode against the concrete block. 